Hey, Chris, thanks for joining us today. As where you're getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Absolutely. So it's nice to uh, to join you and big fan of you. Uh, it seems like a week doesn't pass that uh, one of my sales reps doesn't send me something of yours. Should probably do a little self-reflection on why that is. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's positive. <laughs> it's always positive. It's always positive. Yeah. Uh, a little bit about me, though. I am uh, a father of three amazing children. I have a 10-year-old uh, daughter who's going on 16. And then twin eight-year-old boys who uh, ironically look quite alike, which is helpful when you lose one. <laughs> and uh, uh, been married for 15 years to an wow. just absolute saint of a wife who's uh, definitely put up with a uh, crazy amount of stuff in my uh, my sales career and otherwise. Uh, outside of sales, one of my big passions is firefighting. So I've been doing that for the past 20 years, uh, just as a way to give back to uh, the community I live in and um, absolutely love doing that. A little bit of an adrenaline rush. I as bet. Well. Yeah. well, my first question is, how does a guy who studies accounting get into sales? I've been offered a lot of olive branches in my life, yeah, but we... let me give you the story because my, my journey in sales is quite a bit different than probably most others. So I am a CPA by trade, spent six years at Deloitte as a tax accountant. So one of the most boring jobs that you could probably have coming out of college, but I pay the bills. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I remember quite vividly, it was May of 2012. I was at Milwaukee or at the Milwaukee office and I stepped out into Cathedral Square, which is a park right outside. Yep. I called my wife up and I was like, I, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore. What I was doing is going to bed or sorry, going to work prior to my daughter waking up and then I'd be coming home after she was asleep. I was working mm -hmm. 70, 80 hour work weeks. And at that point I knew there was something better to life than just work. And that's where I started to get into sales. So I actually got into sales as a solution consultant, uh, demoing a tax automation provision, tax provision automation solution. Um, and was just a knockout SC, but yeah. no one could book any appointments for me. So I didn't have anything to do. So from that point, I started just dialing and trying to get some appointments because I was sitting on my hands and actually booked a few and then closed a few deals and ended up being the top sales rep for that uh, that solution. And I guess the rest is history. So now I'm fortunate enough to lead a North American sales team for a, a Series B fintech startup. And what was your view of sales before you got into it? Did you think about it? Was it ever... Uh... A possibility or was it just that's what the guys do with the better suits or <laughs> the better cars no you know i i truly believe that it's a trait that you're born with um it, so? it may it may sound strange but salespeople are inherently born with that trait they can go out and talk to people they can figure stuff out they're very creative they're very curious um so i was always like that i was very entrepreneurial uh back when i was in high school through college, I don't even know how I got into accounting to begin with, because that honestly wasn't a passion of mine. So my thought about salespeople was, it's a tough job. It's an amazing job. You get paid for the output that you put in. Yeah. And I had a lot of admiration for that. And it feels good too, doesn't it? To have control over your income. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the control of your income is very positive. Um, one thing that I always tell my reps, especially the new ones, is that as much as you think you have control over your income, you have to realize that you may not. So if you're having an absolute knockout year, don't start spending like that's going to happen every single yeah, year. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the account you get it. back. Yeah. yeah. How about your experience in accounting, understand how in companies make financial decisions. I, I got to believe that helped you or is that what, it, it was a natural progression. Uh, since yeah. I was a CPA, I was talking to CFOs all the time. And the solution that I sell right now definitely caters towards CFOs. So this, the solution that I sell is a business planning application that goes across CFOs, RevOps, basically unifies the entire organization planning process. So um, talking to the people that I've always talked to and uh, have a very similar background to them. As far as the decision-making process goes, it's it's important to understand what they're up against. I'd have to say that you know, finance is probably one of the easier groups to sell into 
just because they do hold the strings to the, the purse. Um, so it's been a good experience. The background at Deloitte definitely helped. Yeah. And what do they care about? What are they up against? Well, they have to manage a whole bunch of um, things. As much as they want to spend money for themselves, they also have to realize that other parts of the organization are looking at that. Also have so needs. <laughs> they also have needs and they don't want to have fingers pointed at them when they're grossly over budget and they're trying to pull budget from HR or from engineering or, or things of that nature. So it's a very delicate walk. Um, CFOs are historically known as CF knows. Yeah. If you've ever heard that. Uh, but most of the forward thinking ones understand the value of software when they invest in it. And I, I would think that they're one of the harder personas to sell to. Maybe that's just my experience. I always found them kind of dry as to the CF no comment and also um, not cutting edge as far as technology, more laggards. I will say that they are quite a bit behind the curve in technology. They're very risk adverse, but that serves them well in their role, honestly. Um, for instance, the adoption of cloud. You know, when I first got into the, the EPM space, the planning spaces back in 2014, we were trying to evangelize the cloud, which is absolutely crazy. Even Salesforce has been around for how many years? Yeah, um, they've, yeah, so they've gotten over that hump. Once they do adopt that technology, they're extremely loyal. So it may take a little while to get them there, but once you have that customer, they're they're definitely loyal champions of yours. And what things have you learned along the way in sales? Or what what about sales surprised you? So since I don't come from a traditional sales background, I didn't do the BDR thing or anything yeah. like that. I found myself honestly being an imposter for the first year. Um, I say that because I didn't have formalized sales training. I figured it out on my own. So I was trying to piece everything together. I was listening to other reps. I was listening to my boss. And what I found was that I was piecing it all together, but it wasn't genuine. It wasn't me. Okay. And that really hampered my ability to have that genuine connection with our customers. So if I had to replay my first two years, it would be to find that genuineness of me so that I could really portray that to our customers. Did you try and play the sales rep? Meaning like I should start sounding like a rep now and not sounding like a, an auditor. Well, I was a tax guy, so I was never an auditor. Those, those guys are awful. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, I, I joke, I joke. So I, uh, I found myself trying to not sound like a used car salesman. Yeah. You know, sometimes people from the outside coming into sales um, have that background of thought Sing that- hey, songy voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And honestly, I sounded like one when I first started because I was- You thought that's what you syndrome. should do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what got you over it? What what Was there somebody who told you, hey man, just be yourself or- Actually, no, no one, I, I had to come to that conclusion myself. Yeah. And I think that happened as I just felt comfortable because I felt more comfortable in my shoes being a salesperson. Um, I definitely was able to overcome that imposter syndrome. Uh, but I also had some amazing coaches along the way too. So I mentioned a few olive branches that were handed out to me. The The second sales job that I had as a true AE, there's a guy that was very instrumental. I mean, he was, he was, uh, a tough boss, a very fair boss, but taught me the value of preparation, um, making sure that everybody knows their parts during a, a group sale. Yep. Um, it, was, it was a very good experience and I owe a lot to that, that individual. And how about the mindset of accounting? Did that transfer at all? Because you know, accounting, it's very organized, structured, everything reconciles. There's no... You're look, nothing can be left out. Everything it, must balance. and Yeah, everything needs to net to zero. The, um, the thing that I took away that was extremely valuable from Deloitte was just process. Like I wouldn't yeah. change those six years that I was there. It taught me great work ethic and it also taught me the value of process. Having a very good sales process is key throughout um, a sales cycle. You know, if you skip a step, 
you may open yourself up to you know, potentially missing an opportunity to sell some additional value and increase the error or worse yet, yeah, lose opportunity altogether. So following that process and understanding the buyer's journey from finance individual were two of the things that I took over. Yeah. And what, what other skills really took your game to the next level? Was it the process? Was it the personality? Was it the... Being curious. Like yeah. that's, that's truly what it was. I'm a big proponent of cross training. So when you're at the gym, if you're just a runner, yeah. and you don't weight lift, you're probably going to injure yourself. And I feel the same way when it comes to sales, there's certainly some great sales enablement tools out there, but the value that I get, and I'm able to take, um, uh, myself to the next level. And also my, my AEs is just reading outside material, whether it's things related to behavioral economics or um, taking things from my firefighting career and bringing it in as far as leadership goes. There's aspects of your life that are definitely transferable to sales that other people may not be thinking about. Well, certainly. Yeah. I mean, even like the firefighting thing, you know, because a lot of salespeople sell like they're firefighters. <laughs> <laughs> they do, especially at the end of the quarter. Yeah, it's like the bell goes off and they run into the building as fast as they can. <laughs> and that's good for fighting a fire, but maybe not for selling. But you know what? So there's a lot of correlations between firefighting, good firefighting and good selling. Yeah. And the two things that I can uh, correlate are pre-planning. So if you're going to go into a large commercial structure, you're going to know the ins and outs. You're going to know the exits. You're going to have everything pre-planned. Yes. So that goes back to preparation. The other aspect, I absolutely love getting into this flow state when I'm in firefighting. You go into yes. a burning building, there's nothing like it. And honestly, I don't remember much coming out of the burning building. I just know I put the wet stuff on the hot stuff and I did my job and it felt absolutely amazing. I get that same feeling when I'm in sales. When you have a big sales call, you get in that flow state, you may not remember exactly what happened, but you know it felt good and people go based on emotions. Yeah, the adrenaline, the you know, just outside your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much fun. like a big deal. Yeah, it's the whole adrenaline rush. That's why I had to get in firefighting in the first place because when you're an accountant, it's kind of tough to get that. Well, that's it. Yeah, you don't get that as an accountant, and a lot of accountants don't want that. They want the steady, even keeled every day, pretty much the same predictability. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And what do you look for when you're higher reps? So I do look for that sense of curiosity. Um, there's really three things. Drive, which I do feel like you're born with to some degree. Um, a sense of curiosity. And then also um, just a um, general level of intelligence. I hate to say it, but nothing really is going to overcome a lack of intelligence, um, especially when you're focused on coaching so coachability, intelligence, drive, and curiosity would be the four. And when you say intelligence, can you give an example when it wasn't there, where they couldn't understand the product or they can't comprehend how someone else would think about the product or? Thankfully, I haven't ran into that, which is probably a process of good hiring. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I do ask during the interview process is talk to me about some of the books that you've read in the past year. What are the podcasts that you listen to? Things again, question. out. Yeah, things outside of the normal day to day of selling. Yeah, and do you hear a lot of people say, "Well, you know, I, I watch a, I watched PBS once in May." <laughs> <laughs> I do, and the interview ends pretty quickly thereafter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes you get deer in headlights looks, and um, you know, I try to tell them I, I use that honestly as a coaching opportunity during the interview, and say, "Hey, you know, you do need to expand your horizons a bit on." things that could take your sales career to the next level outside of sales. Yeah. And have you sold to people who weren't CFOs or in finance? For the most part, it's always been in wow. finance, whether it's been a CFO, controller, tax director, or a uh, rev ops. And what do they care about when they hear, let's say on a cold approach, what, what do you think would work? On a cold approach, it's all about them. You, know, you have to understand, and again, it goes back to preparation, yeah. what's in it for them. You know, you do your research going in, have that value prop. Rarely is it going to be the same from one account to the next. 
And it takes a tremendous amount of preparation and time to figure that out. If you do that, you go into a sales call, nail it. Yeah. And how about keeping it going though? Because they've got a lot of options that they want. They're kind of viewed as an expense within the company as po they don't generate revenue, right? They may cut costs and optimize the funds, but they're not, you know, product marketing because everybody else makes the product, markets the product, sells the product. It all goes, it, it really goes into proper discovery and figuring out that pain that you can latch on to. Yeah. Um, rarely is there going to be a true ROI, a social, like a hard ROI. It'll be a soft ROI, meaning you're going to yeah. be able to save people time. You may be able to uh, push off a hire. Rarely are we talking about letting people go as a point of ROI, but it's really what can you be doing with your time that you otherwise wouldn't be able to that can further the value of the company. So it's that type of organization, but understanding the pain that you can latch on to to solve ultimately during discovery. Yeah, because I got to believe that they would want more control or visibility of how the business is doing. Yeah, and if, if we're going into the planning cycle, they lose a tremendous amount of that visibility when you have silos. So yeah. for instance, when you're planning just for finance, they're collecting all of this information from other parts of the organization. So you end up having marketing doing their plan. You have rev ops figuring out the sales capacity plan and none of them truly talk to each other. So it becomes a very difficult situation and providing that visibility across the entire organization, having a top line driver that can ripple the effects all the way through the organization is very powerful. And that is something that we're able to help solve for them. And what type of objections do you get from CFOs? We love Excel. Like that is, yeah, they love Excel. <laughs> they, they absolutely love Excel. There's uh there's two customers that we go after a rip and replace of another solution or just net new those net new ones. They're generally uh, tied to either Google sheets or Excel. It's their baby. They've built this mammoth thing that can open only once a day. And, uh, you know, it's job security for them. Yeah. I mean, but Excel has lots of issues as far as like crashing, corrupting. Oh, you tons know, of issues. You yeah. step on cells and you lose the data and the history behind it. The spreadsheet, not a database. Yeah. Exactly. Reporting. Some of the, the crazy, what, what people don't realize is that the people that manage these Excel workbooks are unbelievable programmers. Like when you think about the logic behind there, they are unbelievably creative. It is very complex, but that's what they know. That's the current world that they know. And it's part of us as uh, AEs and sales managers to really enlighten them on a world that may be different. And what's the hardest part of your sale? Painting that vision. You know, yeah. it's, it's really painting that vision and um, getting over the hump that there is a better way of, of doing things. I, I keep going back to the discovery piece. And we've been talking about this internally, having a very good proper discovery and identifying the pains and how you can address them and their ideal solution. The impact of accomplishing that ideal solution really sets you up for overcoming those objections later on in the cycle. And do they have allocated funding for this? Or is it something that they have to yet get approval for from a CEO or? Yeah, there's, there's always, there, there, there's two sides to the coin. I'd say if it's an inbound opportunity, it'll go a little bit quicker because they do have budget and it's top of mind. Thought of it, yeah. But the majority of ours, we're trying to paint a, a vision of what the future might look like for them. And ultimately they haven't budgeted for that vision because they didn't even know it existed. So there's definitely a little bit of horse trading that has to go on once we've painted that vision for them and they have to be a champion internally for, for the project. Yeah. And was there a particular reason you went into product sales versus selling accounting services? You know, because Deloitte has account managers and salespeople, right? I, you know what, I just, I truly love the solution selling aspect of it. And I also love the startup world. Um, those two things you can only really get when you're selling software and the application side of things. You can sell people all day. That's not a novel idea. Um, it just it just really didn't interest me. I actually tried doing that a little bit when I was at Deloitte at the end of the, the six years and made me believe that I absolutely love sales, but that just wasn't the product for me at the time. And what was it like getting into leadership? Because it sounds like you you fit really well into the individual contributor role and you're having fun and there's a lot of adrenaline there. Management. It is. 
I love it. I would never go back is to your adrenaline though. Sure. I do. It's a different kind of adrenaline. Yeah. The adrenaline is seeing my rep succeed and That's it's true, really yeah. a subservient type of um, role. And some of the best stories and the parts that rank me on like, am I doing a good job is seeing the promotion of my, my AEs to managers and BDRs to, to AEs. And it's, it's really fulfilling in that manner. Obviously winning the deals and being a part of that process is equally filling, but you can be a part of something special with, with someone's life, being a good coach and progressing them. Yeah. I mean, what I liked about it, I liked building things. That's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, because the, the problem with being a rep is you're kind of a higher a little mercenary. There's a mission, you go get a deal, and then you go get another deal. And every year you get a different comp plan, a different territory. You know, so there's not enough, there's not really building to it. There's like, it's more transactional. And that's transactional. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's transactional, and a lot of people love that IC role because it gives them that independence. Um, but creating things, you're spot on. Yeah, I absolutely love creating things. I've been fortunate enough to work for, uh, you know, teams where I was a plug and play as a manager, taking over teams that were in transition, and then in my current role, I was fortunate enough to build the sales team uh, along with my counterpart from scratch. So the building aspect is really great when you get it off the ground. Man, is it a hustle! For the first uh, few months, but once you get the, the machine rolling, it's really great to see. And when you're hiring reps, you know, how much experience do you look for? Are there typical red flags that you stay completely away from? So uh, I guess I'll split the question up into two. Um, it depends on the stage of the company. So for instance, the current one that I'm at, we're definitely looking for experienced sales reps because we need them to hit the ground running yeah. and move forward. And we're also going up market. So those two things lends itself to a little bit more experience. Um, other organizations where we play in a little bit more of the mid-market space, we can afford to have a little bit more of a junior rep, maybe someone coming out of the BDR role that has that initiative and that coachability to make into an amazing salesperson. Uh, as far as red flags, um, you know what the, the biggest one. So one of the questions I always ask is what motivates you? And if the first thing they say is money, that's a huge red flag. I believe money is a product of many other motivations put together. If it's solely based on money, they could go out the door next week if they got a better offer. And I need longevity in that role. Yeah. What's a good answer to that question? Good answer is I absolutely want to succeed and be the top of any list you put me on. So I like that. I, I love the competitiveness, um, not to a fault, obviously. Lone wolves never survive, but I always love hearing, I want to be on the top of your stack ranking. If I'm not on the top, I'm going to slap that guy or the, the girl on the back, <laughs> say amazing job, but I'm going to get you next quarter. That's what I look for. Yeah. And that, how about as far as like selling to CFOs, does that have to be on the resume? No, I, it, it doesn't because that's something that I can certainly teach. It helps. You know, one of my, yeah. my top sales reps was a controller. So again, no sales experience. I brought him in as an AE and he was rookie of the year, the first year, and then he was AE of the year, the second year, and then managed a team. So that definitely does help, but it's not a, a prereq. So you can either have, amazing sales experience, or you can have industry expertise. We can certainly coach up the, the other one that's missing. And what did you see people do wrong who hadn't sold to CFOs in the past? Because they're a different animal. I mean, you know them, but a lot of people don't know them. They are a different animal and getting into their you have to get into their heads a little bit, understand exactly what's important with them. They can't just say, I absolutely want this. They have to, again, it goes back to the early part of the conversation. They have to justify the purchase. And that can be a difficult thing to get through. It's a lot easier selling, to, again, to CFOs than HRs, you know, anything like that, or tax directors. But the ones that are not successful are ones that don't really truly understand the role of the CFO. Thankfully, all of our AEs, do understand that through uh, solid enablement, but um, you know, if you don't have that, it's very difficult to sell. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and where did they typically get the deal get stuck with like the new people? Are, are they able to get interest, get some traction through an evaluation, but then it stalls at the approval process? I think so. What I've seen in the past is that they misidentify champions. So there may be a good champion, but truly it's a coach. Yeah. And when you don't have that champion, and you can't get to the executive sponsor. That's where it ends up dying. And, um, you know, it's, it's really imperative that the team understands each piece of the decision-making process and who is ultimately making the decision and who has access to power and all of that. Yeah. Some of the newer reps don't necessarily understand the nuances of the finance department, maybe at you know, a director of finance thinking, okay, this person can make the decision. They said, it's my decision to make. I'm like, eh, it's probably not. You should probably go up another level. And if they're not willing to introduce you to that next level, you should probably take a step back and figure out if you have a champion or a coach. Yeah. <clears throat> and what do you feel you, is the best selling skill that you possess? Curiosity. Yeah. Curiosity and the ability to ask open-ended questions. You know, when you truly are involved in a, uh, a conversation with another individual. It's not you talking to them. Yeah. It's you listening. And the only way that you can do that is open ended questions. And what's your go to question? Is it? Yeah, very simple. Tell me more. Like, that's it. It, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't <laughs> have to be complicated. It's like, <laughs> tell, me tell me more. That's amazing. Tell me more. Yeah. So if, if I'm ever stuck or if one of my AEs are stuck, that's the go to. It works every time. And what's the main emotion that drives CFOs? Is it control? Is it risk aversion? Risk aversion. That's yeah. the biggest one. I, you know, there's some CFOs that uh, like to have control, but they're just like any other executive. Some of the best executives I know know when to delegate that control, but they always are risk averse. I mean, they're always looking at how to mitigate risk. And that's something you have to keep in the back of your mind when you're selling these types of solutions. Right. And that, that, that does resonate with me because they're in a role where they don't really get held up as a hero that much, but they always get blamed a lot. Uh, they're at the top of the totem pole. So yeah, you, you know, they, they have to take responsibility for the financial results and if they're a public company. They have to take you know responsibility for the, uh, the shareholder it, price and accurate and stuff. And, you know, and something that yeah. pops up that they couldn't, it wasn't their fault, but if they still get blamed. Yeah. Yeah. They're always looking out for mitigating that risk at, at any point. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Chris, I appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Easiest way is find me on LinkedIn. Um, just make sure when you type in my name, you don't add an R. So it's Chris <laughs> Tomp. Chris I got stuck Tomp. with that a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pleasure chatting with you. Really enjoyed this.